I still can't wait to play um, Uncharted 4, though. Yes. I think I'm going to play through all the others first, though, again. <laughs> and there you go. That's his early thoughts right there. Oh. <laughs> Hi again, and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Cosmos right here, live, once again, recording from our good home <laughs> at our good friends at Retro City Games. Retro City Games. Retro City <laughs> Games. <laughs> it's Doug right here. Douglas Hoyabu. Hola, everyone. <laughs> oh, co-owner of Retro City Games, along with Nicole Galgazian, who's hiding continuously. <laughs> I'm trying to get her on the show, folks. I swear I am. She's stubborn. No, she's stubborn. <laughs> she, she will make an appearance somehow in some form or fashion in a future es episode. I, I <laughs> will try. But once again, I want to thank you for again for listening to us and watching uh, also as well here right here on Facebook Live on the Retro City Games Facebook page. Uh, also remember to check us out for our radio version on Podcast Radio Network Monday nights. We're going to be back on at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Now the network has had some ups and downs this past couple weeks but we're really glad john was able to take care of things and we're glad to be back on the air this this monday night 10 p.m eastern 7 p.m pacific also as well our good friends in the meantime as, as well that have helped us out as far as being able to be able to broadcast our show the tangent bound network the eso network which has our shows the latest shows also as well online uh, and then catch us also as well you can on stitcher itunes Google Play, podcast.com, and of course, the last three episodes are always posted on popculturecosmos.wordpress.com. So it's a great time of the year. Uh, so there's no excuse not to listen to us. There is no excuse <laughs> not to listen to us uh, or watch us, like I said, on the Retro City Games Facebook page or on Pop Culture Cosmos YouTube page. And maybe in the coming weeks, uh, I heard rumors as well, we may be on even another video format as well. So we truly appreciate you watching, truly appreciate you listening to us. It's Pop Culture Cosmos again, and it is, well, we're in November now. It's I know. deep it's in the heart of November. It is AAA time mm -hmm. because all the big releases are coming out. And also as well, a recent release is the PS4 Pro, yep. which doesn't really count as a console launch, but it counts as kind of as a console launch. What are your what are your thoughts on that? Uh, so I had one pre-ordered and canceled it, um, mainly because I, I want to pick it up later, maybe for a little bit less than the four hundred dollar price point, or possibly with a game. Um, I don't have a four K TV. Uh, I wanted it for the VR experiences, which we talked about last time I was on your show. Um, that I'm thoroughly enjoying, uh, and I've seen what it adds to that, um, and I, I'm excited about it. But four hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's. I mean, uh, and I also expect, like we talked about before the broadcast, I think at some point in time, Sony will reduce the price before Scorpio hits next fall. I'd be shocked if we didn't see it under three um, by the time that happens. Yeah. I think probably, you know, February, March, when we had those, like, those smaller tentative price drops, we'll probably see a 350, maybe a, maybe even a 400 with a two-game bundle like they've done in the past. Yeah. Um, but I, I very much see, by the time Scorpio comes out, because of the rumors of how expensive Scorpio might be, because of the hardware they're putting in it, um, I hope they're not pulling a, a Sony circa PS3 launch. But um, yeah, I, I could definitely see it a, a sub like a 299 price point. Well, it sounds like to me that people are going to really start getting into 4K starting this. Well, actually next week because yeah. uh, or when this airs on radio this week, because Black Friday is coming around. And there's going to be a lot of sales on 4K television. It's now the hot thing as far as electronics are concerned. Yeah. And now we're finally starting to see some, a little bit of a trickle of 4K support from not only cable, not only satellite, but also as well, I'm starting to see 4K Blu-ray starting to be advertised now. It's now starting to become a thing. Uh, Netflix, so, Netflix kind of jumped on it pretty early. They have a pretty, yes. they have a decent library of 4K streaming, but you need the internet to support that. You need the a lot of things that are add-ons to the television and that service that you need. So it, I think it's kind of, it, it's still a tough sell for some people, especially it, with HDR, which we can is, talk it about is later. It is, because but. not everybody has access to it yet. Exactly. So, but then again, they were saying that about 1080p and then 720p, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, it, every time it cycles up, it takes a little while for for the casual market to to get to it. But once they do, they get they you know get into it in spades. I'm just worried because this is a little different. Uh, the, the the 4K jump has a lot more 
things you have to look for and things that change that experience than I think like the 1080p market did. I mean, we can look, we can talk about Hertz and um, contrast ratio and things like that in the last generation of 10 e- or TV, especially the 720 to, to 1080 jump, yeah. um, especially in the, in the P variety. But the problem I think with this is the HDR is you're seeing, we were talking about this earlier, there's a lot of great 4K TVs that are going on sale that aren't HDR enabled. And that's a big difference, especially when you look at something like the Pro that was built around the idea of 4K HDR. And that's something I would definitely go into. Uh, I know Josh and I are going to be talking uh, in the here, coming up here on the great deals for Black Friday. So we're going to try and break that down between, uh, you know, what, what great offers are on 4K TVs that you really should be interested in and 4K TVs maybe you want to want, might want to pass although like i said people are on limited budgets mm-hmm. so it may not be able to afford that six seven hundred eight hundred thousand dollars so when a let's i'll throw that out there because it's already available on popculturecosmos.wordpress.com we already have the walmart black Mar- uh black friday ad mm-hmm. so it's available it's going to be you know next week 295 for a 55 4k TV that, like you said, will not have the HDR. So is that something people should not get into? I, you know, I, I've debated this with a few people, but at, at this point, I feel like if you're not going to spend the extra money on an HDR, DR enabled TV, um, you can get almost a better bang for your buck at the moment with a 1080p set. Yeah. Even a, you know, if your 1080p set is four, five, six, seven years old, like some of ours are, it, that the newer TVs is spending a little bit extra money on you know a higher refresh rate and that better contrast ratio and just you know LED versus LCD and the, and the crisper cleaner colors you might get a better overall experience for your money at this moment right now than just buying a basic 4K TV exactly so I, that's I, what I, I think I, where I agree with you on that I agree with you on that I, I think that's I think that's kind of the issue I'm, I think a lot of people are struggling with is do you spend the even just six seven eight hundred dollars on an amazing 1080p TV or do you spend the, the same money on an okay 4K TV? Well, I, I think it comes down to, do you have enough items out there? Like, you know, do you have Netflix that supports 4K? Do you have Hulu supports 4K? Do you have, as far as satellite TV, that supports 4K? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're still on cable, uh, like I am, uh, that, that doesn't really do that yet. So it's like, uh, you, you want to check to see how many uh, sources of, of that you watch are available right now in 4K before you make that jump. Maybe it's the right time, but maybe next fall might even be a better time for most people. Even, um, I mean, everybody gets caught up in the, in the Black Friday hype as well, but there, there's a lot of deals to be had in that end of January going into February yeah. where people are, or big companies are trying to eliminate the stock that didn't sell during that. Yeah. And sometimes you get the same deals or better deals on better model TVs because they have those one or two left in each store when they had 15. and. They have nothing to do with them. They, exactly. they need to push them out. So I know Nicole and I have, have caught a couple of deals on TVs in that same room, especially during the 1080 era and when LEDs first came out for, I mean, virtually half off just by waiting till February to buy them. So, I mean, good point. that's another option for people. If, if you're really on the fence, seeing what, what this holiday has to offer and kind of let the reviews settle in on what TVs were worth it and kind of just wait a little bit. Because Black Friday is right around the corner, yep. uh, the holiday sh- the holiday shopping season is, is, is about to begin. It's it's really getting going to kick in a high gear, but it's already happening for gamers already because it's now in the middle of November. And usually, like I said, one of the things that goes along with it are console launches. Mm-hmm. And we talked about the PS4 Pro kind of being like a console launch, but uh, same with the Slim, I guess. Same with the which Slim, which we keep everybody keeps trying to talk about. Yeah, but. That's, so so tell me. Note to me some of your favorite console launches of the past. Because I know uh, Xbox recently celebrated its anniversary, PS3, Wii, they all celebrate their anniversaries as well. Uh, a lot of uh, consoles have released during the course of, of November because it's at that height of the shopping season. So tell me about some of the uh, the best console launches that you remember so, that, that, that stick out in your mind. So a lot of people that, um, the, the two that are both actually, I think it's part of what made me a little bit of a, I don't want to say fanboy, but a fan of it is um, I'm a big PS2 fan. A lot of people, almost everybody that knows me knows I love the PlayStation 2. And really? I didn't know I, that. Not at all, right? Um, and for me, it was a... I heard you like the Vita too, although, you know, a, a, Rob a, says you may not. A little bit, right? Just, just muy poquito. But the, uh, <laughs> um, when, the, when the PS2 came out, um, I think it was 12, 11 or 12, maybe 12, I think. And um, I had a Super Nintendo. I didn't have an N64. I didn't have a PlayStation. Didn't have a Dreamcast. All my friends did. Uh, you always had that friend that had all these other things, and I used to play all the consoles, so I was still stuck in the 16-bit era at home. 
Um, I had a little bit of PC games to play off of, but it wasn't the same as the consoles at that time. And uh, it, they were sold out everywhere. I was begging my parents for one, and it, everybody was like, no, no, no. And then on Christmas morning, my parents surprised me, and I had a PlayStation 2. Caught you hook, long, and singer. Oh, and I, I sat there for probably three days straight, did nothing but play Tekken Tag Tournament. That was the only game they could find at the time, and really the only game. In sh- games were sold out everywhere. And um, it, it just, it, I don't know, it just, it, I hadn't had... And at the time when it came out, the, the graphics and the immersion and just everything about it, the, the, the scope of the games was so much different than what we'd had before. Even the Dreamcast was great, but the PS2, I felt, just put it to that next level. And so it just kind of stuck with me. And I remember when the, um, leading into my adult life, when the, when the PS3 came out, um, that was the first console I quote-unquote camped for. Yeah. Um, it wasn't at launch because I knew that was impossible. I wasn't going to be there days before. But um, when I had a buddy that worked at Best Buy, and there was the second shipment coming in, and he kind of gave me the heads up, hey, I have the invoice right now. They're coming in tomorrow. So we're getting like seven. So if you want one, you got to be here like now. <laughs> so I got off work, um, went down there, and a bunch of my friends and I, we all camped out all night at Best Buy. And oh, that's cool. Came, so that, that was to me, that was just, it was more than about the, the console itself. It was about the whole experience of getting it. And it was freezing out here because even though we're in a desert, at nights it gets cool white cold in <laughs> November. <laughs> so uh, I remember for I've told you the story about me and PlayStation 3 where we were at uh, Kmart and there was only three available and an entire store of people were waiting for a raffle off as far as who would get the chance to get it and uh, I had a group of about seven people and when they called the number it was my niece and she screamed I won! I won! I won! <laughs> I can't pay for this! It's $700! Here you go Uncle Gerald! And it's like that you know that's so that worked out there. Um one of my favorite console launches was actually like uh, the one that you know recently celebrated an anniversary, the original Xbox. Because something that doesn't get talked about enough uh, as far as a console uh, mover, one of those killer apps, as they say, um, Xbox is one of those rare occasions where it had a game that was a quote-unquote killer app in Halo. Halo. And I think for me, buying one at that time, around the time uh, in the early months, that that's what it sold me was that that fantastic game that it was because it still even holds up today even it on the part of the Master Chief collection as far as how good a narrative it is comparative to most video games even today. Well, it gave you just enough of that world to make you go, what else is there? And then you, you could play it through two, three, five, ten, twenty times and find more little things and things started to fit together and you started realizing how big and really well thought out the universe was and I think that's part of the reason it's been such a successful franchise exactly exactly so tell me about one that another one that sticks out for you as hard as so um because i have one as well as well that i wanted to share but go ahead not that i'm the the biggest fan of the console uh, nicole's a huge collector of it um the nintendo wii i was gonna say that yeah working at um i was working at game crazy when that came out i were i started just after it was, it was a second job for me so it was only about 10 to 20 hours a week depended on the week but what was interesting about it is a we couldn't keep them in stock and I mean, months after it came out, could not keep them in stock. I would, I still have never seen anything like it. I remember that as well, running a game crazy too here. But what was, what was interesting to me was all the people coming in that didn't play games, but they wanted a Wii. It was the, the grandmas and the grandpas. The moms, the dads. Yeah, yeah, it was the people who, they played a Wii at a friend's house and they go, this Wii Sports thing is great. I think the idea of it coming with a, a game like that it was kind of like a Super Mario World type thing. It got it captured everybody. I even had uh, my, my some of my employees were you know I let them they asked me and I gave them permission. They would go, "Hi, thanks for choosing Game Crazy. My apologies, but we unfortunately do not have Wii's at this time because click. Click, because <laughs> you would get anywhere from twenty to thirty to fifty, almost like as many messages you get at yeah. Retro City Games <laughs> here a day." Asking for the Wii, and when you're only allotted what two to five a month, it was you know first come first serve. You know people would try to make deals, back end deals for them, and oh, try yeah. to offer you things. It was just like it was crazy because it, you know it was just over this you know two hundred fifty dollar box, and that also did have one of the again one of the very few occasions it did have a killer app. Now people don't really think that on some occasions, but. When you're talking Wii Sports, Wii Sports to a casual audience was a killer app. Well, and even still now, I mean, if I have Wii Sports in stock, I sell more Wiis, even now. And we sell our Wiis, I feel, pretty cheaply. And it's still it's still a console that moves fairly well. But the second I stick Wii Sports next to it or bundle it in with it, 
it's it's a same day type of thing. Yeah, it, people still like and want to play that experience. Uh, it, indeed, because it's you know for that it was it, for what it does it it's just truly really a fun experience as well for getting some people together to play uh, uh, Wii Sports or any of the really interactive games that it, that it offered. Well, and it's so it's so universal. I mean, Wii Sports is one of those things. There's enough games on there. Everybody likes one of those sports. And there's enough where you can literally play all the games from sitting on the couch to you can stand up and pretend you're the actual person. And there's enough, in most of the games, there's enough of a um, a, a, a skill barrier, I guess I should say. Like, so there's enough where the casual person can come in and compete and play and have fun. They're not going to do terrible. But if you really practice at it, you can actually be better at the games. Yeah, yeah, and I so I think that, that really kept people engaged with it until bigger games came out. Some of the ones that were not so memorable as far as console launches, in my mind, uh, PlayStation 3, I think, sticks out. Uh, Xbox 360, um, I'd probably say that sticks out as well for, for certain reasons. Uh, I, don't, I think they wanted um, um, uh, Dark, as far as it's concerned, that Perfect Dark, the perfect uh, dark uh, to be that killer app. And unfortunately, I played it, got it. Uh, a 360 early on as well in this life cycle and and unfortunately like for many people uh, Perfect Dark did not endear itself to me there's an arrow telling you where to go exactly I mean so, <laughs> literally <laughs> the the multiplayer was was all right but the the single player narrative was was pretty bad and obviously comparing itself to the N64 uh, oh. as far as version of it it was pretty much not 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 a comparison at all well Microsoft spent all that money on rare and then didn't utilize any of their IPs. I mean, until really until recently now. Yeah. I mean, we had, I mean, even on the 360, you had Viva Pinata. Uh, was Blue Dragon them? No. There was one off the wall game no. they did. What was the, it was some weird game they did. Uh, I'm drawing a blank now, I'm going to get killed for this. Um, but, I mean, they, they just kind of said, I mean, kind of a Banjo and Kazooie game, not a nuts and bolts kind of thing. And then they started making Kinect games. I mean, you that, kinda, was, that was the <laughs> problem. When they started going to Kinect games, now, what, Rare is still alive. It's, they're still, you know, they've, they've now got a better, better, as far as since Rare Replay, they've got a better focus. <laughs> so, um, possibly being the worst console launch, you know, PlayStation 3, possibly, especially because oh. of the high price, A, and B, the, the launch lineup was really not that great of a, a selection is concerned. It sold well. It just didn't, it didn't have the software to build hype. Yeah. I think they were really banking on Resistance, and while Resistance, I, I really like the game, it's not for everybody. No, it's no. it definitely wasn't a pick up and just run and gun. It was it wasn't a Halo. It wasn't something that was going to grab you and easy to play and jump into. Um, and yeah, there wasn't a whole lot. I mean, we had like Genji and stuff like that, but those were more specific titles for a specific genre of people. Um, for me, and I get beat up on this a lot. It's the N64. Like, even as a kid, I mean, my friends... And I know you will get probably beat up on it even more. Yeah, uh, I mean, it launched... I mean, it, obviously, you know, it was it was amazing with um, Mario 64 and... GoldenEye and some other later hits. But later, that was the issue, is at launch, I believe, and I, I could be wrong, but I believe there were only two games actually day one. I believe Pilot Wing 64... Was it Wave Race or no? I think Wave Race came out the week after. Okay. I, be I believe when it, when it first came out... There were two games. I, I could be wrong, but it was very limited either way. We were talking about maybe three. Yeah. <laughs> so it was one of those things where I remember a friend had it, and we loved it. It was, oh, my, oh my this is a 3D you know, experience. It was the first real 3D experience. Yeah. You know, I played things like Doom and stuff like that, but it wasn't a 3D character, and it wasn't, it wasn't the same thing. And I'm not going to say we got tired of it, but we were waiting for something else. We were playing it, and we played so much of that game, but... Yeah, we were, we were really waiting for the next thing to come out, and it kind of killed our hype. And we were playing more Super Nintendo a week later than we were N64, and that was kind of bad looking back on it. <laughs> That's probably the best sign that you can say uh, for something as far as what speaks most about a console launch. When you're playing the previous system more than the current system, uh, the new system that you just got, that, that speaks volumes. I think a lot of people said that with the PlayStation 3 is that they went back to the PlayStation 2 or they bought the PlayStation 3 only because they could get the backwards compatibility of the play that the PlayStation 2 was supposedly offered as an emulator in there. So, Well, even even this generation, I mean, to touch on a couple more, I mean, the as much as I love the console, the, the Wii U, I mean, a couple weeks in, there, you could find Wii U's almost 
anywhere. Well, I was, think on launch day you could find Wii U's. Anywhere. Yeah, it was it was pretty. I remember, I remember a bit. I remember seeing it on the shelf, pictures of it on shelves at Walmart and whatnot on launch night. Yeah, it's um, I don't know. People still, and I know I've said this before. People still think that the Wii U is an attachment for the Wii. They think it's an add-on, and people, most people, were done with the Wii years ago and don't want anything. So it's like, what is this? I know they have the Wii U for the Wii. I get that all the time. So what's this new console they're talking about? So people literally, there's a whole group of people who are excited about the Switch, but have no idea the Wii U existed. And that yeah. blows my mind that it's that bad of a marketing campaign and had that bad of a, just a presence. Like, And now you see why that the success of the Wii U was was very fleeting at best. And unfortunately for the Wii U, it's uh, already, I believe, stopped in production. And I think that's the latest rumors that it, that it w- was stopped in production in Japan. And Japan, I think they've confirmed it stopped production in yes, Japan. Yes, because I know there was rumors that they were saying yes and no and yes, no. Uh, it looks like it's going to be the Switch, which has a lot of hope. So I'm hoping, on that note, that the Nintendo Switch's uh, console launch will be a lot better than the Wii U's. Um, and also, as well, I'm, I'm hoping that the Scorpios launch next fall, and they'll take some lessons from what you're saying about the PS4 Pro, not having enough titles that you see should be available for it, correct? I agree. And I think Microsoft, I, I know they've had a few months of, of solid sales, but they have a lot of catching up to do. Um, as much, I, and everybody thinks because I'm, I'm such a big PlayStation fan that I'm rooting against other consoles. I'm not. I, we need, you know, we need that console, not parity, but we need competition. Multiple, yeah, the, you need the competition. You need everybody picking each other up. And, you know, if there's no competition, everybody lacks. Um, even, I mean, I have, a, I have an Xbox One now, but that's another launch that was kind of okay it, again i mean even the ps4 to an extent like the lack of games at launch was kind of i agree with you on that one i was so i bought one because of killzone i'm a huge killzone fan i really wanted to play killzone and after that i played wolfenstein which was months later when i really played it i i mean again i'll play my ps3 more than i'll play my ps4 when it came out this i guess this whole console generation it's in as a whole wasn't as exciting as i hoped it would be no but it's slowly rounding into shape uh obviously this year is something we're going to take a look at uh with some with some good hits that are really starting to help these out these new modern consoles into shape uh, we're going to take a look at with your early game of the year thoughts and we'll do that right after the break this is the pop culture cosmos all right and we're back with the Pop Culture Cosmos, this is Gerald Glassford from the Pop Culture Cosmos and Game Source, along with my good friend Douglas Hoyabu, co-owner <laughs> of Retro City Games. That's Retro City Games, the leader in video gaming here <laughs> in Southern Nevada. Any quick words on what's com- upcoming for Retro City Games? Any plans? If you have any questions, by the way, because they get a ton of questions e- each day that they go out of their way to answer, please let them know. It's Retro City Games on Facebook, and you, where you can also catch the videos from most of our episodes of Pop Culture Cosmos right here on the Retro City Games Facebook page. But it is Retro City Games right here, the leader in video gaming for Southern Nevada. Also wanted to give a shout out to our good friend Rob McCallum. Hope you're doing great out there, my friend. I know he's out there filming. Mm-hmm. Goodness knows what for goodness knows project what, but I tell you what, <laughs> he's got a lot of them on the plate. And if you want to check out all the great things he's up to check it out at robmccallumfilms.com which includes the award-winning missing mom i know he had a great uh showing at the alamo house i believe in texas uh and also a win at the forest uh city film festival as far as that that's concerned i believe he won best documentary overall yes yes he did i saw him get the tree oh yeah yeah yeah. for forest city (laughs) exactly (laughs) um i know he just was recently named a producer i believe in the morgan spurlock uh upcoming barbie documentary i Mm -hmm. believe that was correct uh plus he's got a lot of other stuff that that he's doing the kitty documentary the great docu-series coming up with box art which is with some two people i know and love (laughs) nicole right over there and also as well, Doug. Any updates on that? I know you want to. You haven't filled in the fans a little bit on exactly. What, I know you guys are are laying low for now, but you got some things coming up uh, here in the in the 
little bit of a lull through the, the holiday season. Um, Rob just got back from Chicago, did a couple great interviews there. Um, but uh, right now, um, our next plans are not until January, um, but okay. we're still filming. Um, two of the episodes are in the bag, um, for the most part done, just needing the audio work done and a little bit of graphic work and everything. Um, the other four episodes are, are shaping up. We have the inter- most of the interviews that we're going to get in the bag for season one. Um, so we should be ahead of schedule. I know Rob hates it when I say that to people, but we're ahead of schedule at the moment, so everything's looking great. Okay. So you're not getting the, let's say if you were a big major production film, you would not be getting the the film company mad right now at you. The, uh, the, cause you, if you, is that correct? No, 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 we're not behind. But, okay. but uh, I, I know I, the, we promised a certain date, and that was to give ourselves time just in case. Okay. And to see what came up, but uh, so far we're really confident and happy with what we have so far, and and the way things have gone. Um, everything just kind of fell into place. Not too many big issues or snags or anything like that. So I'm 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 excited. Awesome. So that's something to look forward to. So check it out at RobMcCallumFilms.com for box art, the docu series. Also, as well, you can check out Missing Mom, Nintendo Quest, Nintendo Quest Power Tour, the Kitty documentary. Uh, the He-Man documentary. Mm-hmm. Uh, am I missing something? Because I always seem to think after the show ends, I'm like, I forgot something that Rob is doing. Plus 800 other projects Rob's working on. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, look out for that. But if you want to know everything that he's up to, it's robmccallumfilms.com. Also want to give a big shout out to Wine, Women, and Words, who recently had an episode, which we will hopefully give you a taste of on this week's episode where they were talking about the Harry Potter series leading up into Fantastic Beasts, which is already out in the wild. Uh, so I want to take a look out for Came that. Out last night, right? Yes, yep. uh, it did indeed. Uh, it has uh, garnered really strong reviews, obviously going to make big money, uh, even maybe even more than Doctor Strange. So we'll it's very interested to see how that lays out. Uh, that's Wine, Women, and Words on YouTube and also podcast.com. Our good friends, the Mario Party Wars, mm-hmm. Sal, uh, Larna, Yelthin, those crazy kids from Mario Party Wars, they're wreaking havoc in UNLV. It's somewhere at some time doing something relating to either board gaming, Mario Party, or what have you in video games. They're streaming on Twitch. You check it out, Mario Party Wars on Facebook. It's a lot of fun. They're a great group indeed. Uh, Game Source on Facebook and Twitter, at Game Source on Twitter, Game Source on Facebook. If you want to keep up to date on the video game world, uh, we post you know tons of articles and stuff out there on the on the video game information scene so if you want a quick place to go to check it out there it takes you all the great information out there in the video game scene um i'll cannot forget my good friend josh peterson who i'm usually talking to if i'm not talking to you (laughs) or i'm not talking to a guest um really appreciate all of his help with pop culture cosmos and check out his book vendetta dark available today on amazon.com or his recent docu-series Kind of a, you know, as far as maybe a little bit of a mockumentary series, uh, Ghost Toasters, which is also available on popculturecosmos.wordpress.com or Ghost Toasters on YouTube. So um, we are now getting into some early Game of the Year thoughts. I had talked with Josh last week on some of our thoughts and some of his thoughts going into it. What are your thoughts on a, is this a strong year for gaming? And what are your, some of your leaders in the clubhouse as far as as we make the turn using the golf, so to speak, uh, on this ga- game of the year? For, for me, it's kind of weird. Um, I it, it's been I feel like this year's been a little light. Like I mean, as far as like the big triple A type titles, we had Uncharted mm-hmm. come out early this year. Um, I know which garnered great reviews. Overwatch. Um, um, Overwatch. Overwatch was I, I I I haven't even played Overwatch, and I feel like I played it. <laughs> I mean, the amount of people that talk about Overwatch. Um, I mean, it's really quickly ingrained itself in, oh, it's in streaming, in esports, everything. It's it's just really done done a great job of doing that. And it's weird. Normally, I'm not the person to be into these, but but this year with the the HD remasters and the re releases, I don't want to say that I could nominate a game that's like that for <laughs> a well, game Josh, of the year. Josh was but trying really hard to do it for Skyrim, but I was like, yeah, no, uh, I can't. Well, with, with Skyrim, with uh, all the Resident Evils. Um, the Valkyrie Chronicles, Odin Sphere. Odin Sphere is it was already a gorgeous game, and they just fixed every the little issues it had wrong. All those frame rate issues are gone, and then they somehow made that game more beautiful. I don't know how they did that, but <laughs> um, yeah, I it's weird to to me. Like I said, you, you mentioned earlier, I'm a big Vita fan, 
and things like even though I hadn't finished the first one, I had to pop in Trails of Cold Steel 2. I, I, I completely misjudged the first game <laughs> on how long it would be. I was like, oh, this game's I, I was oh, this game can't be more than, you know, 60, 70 hours. And here I am 80 hours into the game. <laughs> and I finally look it up and I'm like, oh, you're like halfway. If you're completing the, going the completionist yeah. route. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> so for, for me right now, I think my love of that series is kind of leaning towards that game, which I know two didn't get the same reviews that everything else that the first one got. But the first one, we're all over the place. But yeah. right now, I'm kind of leaning towards that, which people think I'm crazy. But And as I mentioned in a previous episode, I think Inside should get strong in, uh, consideration as a mm-hmm. great download t- title. Firewatch. I Firewatch. don't know if I mentioned on that, that last week. Um, I know there's going to be a limited run of it Firewatch, on, yeah. on a disc. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you can also get it, obviously, available downloading and whatnot. Um, there's, there's some great downloadable titles that, that have come out over the course of the year. Uh, one of those, Rocket League, uh, which Josh mentioned. I want to give him props for mentioning that because that almost – people seem to forget that. T- that came out as such a sensation, and it really performed, outperformed what people, many people would thought we would do. And it's now it's become ingrained like you know Overwatch as an eSport as well. Did you see Shaq's team recently just won <laughs> a major tournament? <laughs> that, exactly. So it's – it's it's now a part of ingrained in that culture. Uh, that's Rocket League. I think that well, deserves some strong consideration. It's as well. fun to watch, and it's easy for people to figure out what's. Even the cat, a person who doesn't play games could watch that and figure out what's going on. I mean, it's exactly. soccer with cars. I mean, it's 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 not really a tough concept to to grasp. And then I mean, some of the amazing highlights and some of the crazy stuff that happens in that game just I think keeps it interesting. I I've played exactly one round of Rocket League since we bought it, um, but I've watched a. Ton ton of highlight reels and gameplay and as and I, I played a little bit of it too but like you i've, I've watched uh, quite a bit of it as well because it is an entertaining as far as what those little buggies can do um i know titanfall 2 is getting a lot of consideration dishonored 2 which just came out i still need also, to pick that up yeah that's getting a lot of strong consideration as well battlefield 1 uh is, this seems to be for many people a a great return to the series Minus any bugs or issues, because it doesn't seem to be having as many as, as some of its predecessors did. So Everybody that's always loves a good flying thing. tanks. Yes, <laughs> and there's some. No, I know it's, it's it's not bad. I mean, I think a lot of the I, the I, issues people were talking about is overhyped. It's not well. But remember, Battlefield Four and Battlefield Three. They had the, especially Battlefield Four had the issues with the server and whatnot down for weeks as far as Three's actually issues what, with and problems with it. Not down as entirely, but you know, people had a lot of issues logging into the servers for weeks on it. Three actually got me out of the series because the game was broken almost completely. I mean, yeah. it was it, there were, especially on the online, it was almost unplayable at times. And instead of fixing those issues, they just pumped out four as fast as they could. Yeah. And then, like you said, it still wasn't fixed, but they did nothing for the people who spent tons of time and money on the first one. Exactly. And then they pumped out a new game. Like I said, I think it was literally a year later. And then they said, which was pretty much an expansion. Four is pretty much three. Yeah. It looks the same. It plays the same. It was really just a reskin and new stuff um so it kind of threw me out of it battlefield one is awesome i love that game <laughs> well, let's see, there you go I mean, it, it they took a risk by taking it back to a world war one as opposed to let's say world war two where a lot of the the first person shooters originated from or taking it you know like call of duty did uh god bless you like call of duty did into another direction but it seems like that they made the right move going forward with that series. Well, yeah, it's weird. I mean, we used to make fun of Call of Duty because another World War II game, and now there really aren't any good World War II in that era coming out. So Battlefield One, you know, kind of fits that. That it's a different really, era. It's not really been approached very much. Uh, Valiant Hearts, I think, is the only yeah. one I can really, off the top of my head, in recent times that that's really approached a World War Some One setting. Yeah, and, and, and well, at least done it well is, is the biggest thing. And it's one of those things where I think we just have such a glut of space shooters. And I know that's the biggest you know thing with Call of Duty right now. It's just another space shooter. And I think pre-orders and sales are kind of showing that. This is the worst-selling Call of Duty in, of the Modern Warfare series. And it was the least pre-ordered. I mean, people were kind of... I don't want to say they're like revolting against it, but people were just done. I think it's, for, not, they're a, not, it's not the worst review because that that in recent times because Ghost I think is the worst reviewed of, of all of them. True, but as far as sales is what I'm saying, yeah. people, people just aren't 
buying them. Yeah. Well, at this point, at least. And then also the first person glut of first person shooters that came out um, as far as Titan, which a lot of people had to take issue with because Battlefield 1, the next week, the same company releases Titanfall 2. And then a week, pretty much, well, I guess a few days, uh, almost wait, a little bit over a week later, uh -huh. uh, came out Call of Duty. So that's back to back to back. That's kind of... And they're all primarily... Well, they have campaigns online-based. Exactly. It's all that multiplayer. So if you're going to... And people want to stick to one. I mean, people like to get good at one of the games and really sink their teeth into those skill trees and stuff like that. So I think it's... Like you said, it's tough when three come out like that. And, and exactly, back to back to back. So that people have to make the choice. And um, people may be tired of going to it, especially if there's great games like Overwatch that, that people are still heavily into that might be more appealing. Or Battlefield 1, which got the jump on, on all of them. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, that's something definitely look forward to indeed. Um, if you are interested in sending us your thoughts on the game of the year and what you think it will be, well, we'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to first off, there's, there's places that you can go like, like Pop Culture Cosmos on Facebook or at Pop Culture Cosmo. But I think I'm going to put something up on your page yeah. at Retro City Games on Facebook where you can share and express your thoughts. So look out for it. It'll be coming up in the next couple of days. Retro City Games on Facebook, where you can see you know this video right here um, as well. But you can also share your thoughts on what the game of the year is going to be, because at the end of the year we will be announcing, as we did with Game Source every year prior, uh, a game of the year as far as award and thing to do and la 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 la. So look out for that. We we truly appreciate your your thoughts and your opinions on it. Uh, just be nice when you share your opinions. That's, that's all I'm saying. Respectful of others when you do. <laughs> right? So. Yeah, it's a it's an opinion, not a fact. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so. Oh, and there's one more I guess I should throw in there. Again, the, the Vita person in me. Um, if anybody hasn't played Labyrinth of Death. Oh, there you go. It is a sleeper hit. I mean, it's it's definitely a JRPG. Um, have you have you seen the game? I've seen the game. It's it's imagine old anybody's a fan of like old school dungeon crawlers. Yeah. It is a old school dungeon crawler. I mean, frame by frame, turn left, turn right in the overworld. But then once you get into battle, it's turn based awesomeness. But you play as chibi anime girls who turn into mechs. What's not to like? What's not to like? <laughs> I mean, and I know Josh mentioned For Forza Horizon 3, which, in his words, could possibly be the best Forza in the entire series, counting both series. So, oh, I haven't played it yet, but I've, that's pretty strong. Yeah, it, it's, it seems it's garnered a, a high Metacritic rating. We checked it out last week, and it's really done a, a great job of, as far as um, recreating that Australian paradise area. So it's uh, something that definitely, uh, if you are a racing fan, you may want to look out for indeed. But those are our, some of our Game of the Year thoughts. If you also want to check out last week's episode, Josh uh, and I shared some more thoughts on it. I think you know me, it's Uncharted 4. I think it's probably still my leading contender, but uh, we'll go from there. Uh, next year, you never know, with Mass Effect. Uh, you know, already anticipating that one as well. But uh, Uncharted 4 for me right now. If you want to share your thoughts, again, I'll be posting something on Retro City Games' Facebook page by the time this airs on the radio, uh, on the podcast radio network. So look out for that. Or if you just want to tweet us out at Pop Culture Cosmo, at Game Source on Twitter, at Pop Culture Cosmos on Facebook, or Pop Culture, uh, excuse me, Game Source on Facebook as well. Mm -hmm. So when we come back, it's been a few years. It's been a long time a since, a, since the announcement of this upcoming game, which for many has been a heartache. For many has been an ulcer. For others, it's been a joke in the industry. But we will talk about the enigma known as The Last Guardian right after the break. This is the Pop Culture Cosmos. You have only put a couple hours into Labyrinth of Death but it's pretty cool. Uh, I've, I've, like I said, I've seen a stream of it, and I, I, I really liked it, and I've seen also uh, videos and the highlights of it, so it looks really, really cool. It sold terribly in the US. <laughs> I was looking at numbers a couple weeks ago when it, when it came out, really, and I was like, oh, that's, oh. It was pretty much pre-orders, and that was it. That's a, that's a conversation for another day as far as reaching that type, of, uh, that type of game with that type of audience, and that's something I think we should deal with here on the show coming up in, in a future episode. I, I agree. Because um, it's been a long-standing problem. One of the biggest issues is um, the, the culture here in the U.S. That, you know, has been established where you have people... 
in, in Japan, a lot of times the handheld games cost just as much as the full console releases because they're considered full games. Yeah. So in the U.S., when you discount that, it's tough for a publisher to put a lot of money into it when they're already taking a 30% hit just on the retail. Yeah. So they can sell a game in Japan for $50, $60, and here it comes out 30 or 40 That's a big difference, especially when you're talking about all that time and money to rework it for a U.S. audience. So that's why a lot of them, like, keep getting pushed back and pre-orders because they're working on these skeleton crews and would rather just push it back than not put it out at all. You know what I mean? It's Well, there is a following here in the U.S. for Japanese games as a whole, but they don't seem... I don't know. Sometimes it just seems, like you said, it, it you think it's going to be larger than what it is, and then when it ultimately hits the market, it just doesn't seem to translate into the numbers that you, you would expect. And I, I think, like I said, I think that's when you put it on like consoles like the, the Vita and things like that. I mean... I feel it started in the PlayStation 3 era, era where people were like, I'll buy a PS3 when there's the JRPGs that I want. And there were still games selling on the PS2 after the PS3 was out. And I think we kind of hit that same thing here where there were RPGs coming out, but not the kind of RPGs people wanted to play. Yeah. So I think a lot of people were still stuck on the PS3 for all these great RPGs they wanted. But when a new PS4 RPG comes out, people don't buy it because I feel like consoles now are sold to the masses on the backs of shooters and on the backs of these big action games the uncharted the call of duties the halos you know what i mean they really drive console sales and the, those niche those majority i guess majority niche markets if there aren't 10 rpgs to play they don't care so i think a lot of people get into it late to go back and play those games but it suffered and new game sales suffer because of it what do you think they can be done to maybe liven that that genre up to make it more attractive to a larger audience i think something like if Final Fantasy was a launch title and they would actually show uh, the amount of people I talk to and they go oh Final Fantasy I'm like are you excited for the new one no I'm not really into like turn based it's action RPG and people go holy crap but you watch the trailers and stuff and they don't show combat they don't show all that and people I think the audience the casual audience has no idea that RPGs cannot be turn based because even myself I like action RPGs over turn based I play turn based but I'm much more of an action RPG even like Tales of, I get so many people into the Tales of series because I'm like, oh, they're pretty much like a, a modified action RPG of the arena type style thing. And people buy them and they love them because it's just like playing an, an action game yeah. with, a, with a skill tree. And Nino Kuni, another one like that that people people overlook because they go, oh, it's just another... But that was jam- a surprise hit it to was, an extent. It was, but it, I feel the second one's going to sell so much better than the first because people now Oh, that know. didn't. Well, no, it didn't. People, huh? The second, second yeah, one didn't, didn't say it, That's what I'm saying. I, w- I wished it had, but I felt like that was going to be the case, and I think it's part of the same problem. It's just companies, like, Sony's the worst at it, informing the customer, the, the casual person, showing them this is what it is and this is why it's like that, instead of just pumping everything out on a name. Maybe a thought is to maybe to bundle them together. Maybe yeah. t- instead of taking, you know, saying to these Japanese developers, hey, you're not going to be able to sell it in mass at a full price just by itself. So maybe if you partner yourself up with maybe some other JRPC, JRPGs and within the same realm or whatnot, maybe two or three together in a bundle and just going out at that, maybe that, that could garner at least a little bit more marketing power, but also as well mo- more notoriety and better value for customers here in the U.S. That just happened uh, with uh, Yomawari and... What was the other game? Yomawari uh, um, Night Alone, the the collector's edition, uh, comes with two games on one on one cart. Okay. So that that same idea where they knew the one game wouldn't stand on its own, so they bundled it with the other and charged a little bit more. So instead of the standard, most collector editions on the Vita are sixty bucks, as opposed to the forty for the standard game. This one was eighty, but it came with two games plus all the collector stuff. So I I agree that might actually be a really good. Thing. They do it with shooters, look at like the Bioshock series, or you see Ubisoft releasing another greatest hits type thing. Why not do it with RPGs? Uncharted I agree. Collection and whatnot that that sold strongly at first when it came out because people were, that hadn't played it yet, uh, wanted to get into the series. Same thing, like I said, would would go for this as far as with three, you know, decently or, or quality rated G, or JRPGs coming out from Japan bundled together, maybe getting a better uh, distributor here for the U.S. or somebody that's going to put some money into it, maybe that's a better package to sell to consumers. Well, we also see, you know, the trend for a while was JRPGs didn't sell very well. They were that niche group. And so a lot of them come here and they are limited quantities. 
I mean, look at look at Xenoblade, <laughs> the first Xenoblade. It was a GameStop exclusive, and they couldn't keep it in stock. Yeah. To the point where they were reprinting the game, opening it, and selling it for more. Yeah. I mean that that kind of demand. So. I, I think it's part of just that, that limited availability that some people don't want to get into it because it is kind of expensive. Yeah. Even look back, I mean, you start buying PS1, PS2, and like even some PS3 RPGs are starting to creep up. It's an expensive thing to get into. So if you're not if you're not in on it the second it comes out, they don't sit on store shelves for a year. They no. don't end up in the, the $20 section at Best Buy and Walmart because there weren't enough copies made. So And it's weird because we see that from big companies like Square where we don't see you know games like... Final Fantasy 15. I, I guarantee six months later, it'll be hard to find that game new, even though it's a Final Fantasy game. I mean, you already see uh, what is it? The HD collection has been that I may disagree with you on because I yeah. think that's going to go. I think that's going to be trying to push big. I think there's so much of a development issue and development cost, which we're going to get into with the Last Guardian. Um, I think that it it just they need to go ahead and push that out with commercials and whatnot. So six months, you will be able to still find that. Even like the um, the, the HD collection um, that they, they put out. Well, that's that, different. Well, that, I'm saying that, 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 that pulled off shelves and then came back. They did another production run, and now it's in like the twenty dollars bins. But there was a good there was a good while you couldn't find that game. Okay, but fifteen, I might have to disagree with you on because I think okay. they they're targeting that as a triple A game. I'm, like I said, I'm just worried it's going to sell like a AAA game. I don't know if it will. I think you'll have the hardcore fan base go out and buy it. I don't know if they'll get new people into the series. Because we haven't seen, like I said, we haven't seen any... Final Fantasy has this problem with, and a lot of JRPGs, advertising with cutscenes and story. And they don't advertise with gameplay. And, you know, so when, when you have games like, you know, Ninja Gaiden 2 <laughs> out selling Final Fantasy games at that, that uh, generation, when it's similar gameplay, that's, that's, that's really weird. <laughs> well, yeah, because they, they have to approach when they're advertising and marketing this to a different base. They have to market it towards that base, and they can't market it, use the same marketing strategies and campaigns that they used in Japan here. It's a similar thing to Europe. You have to use a different marketing strategy when you go and market to Europe than way you, the way you would in the U.S., because the, the tastes as far as the consumers, as far as they're different than what they are in each region. Yeah. And it's, it's, I don't think they've done a good job of that. Because like I said, I, just for me on this side of the counter, a lot of people come in and have no clue how this game or that game plays. Because the, the customer is lazy. They're not going to, most people, if they hear about a game and they go, eh, I, it doesn't look like, it doesn't look like something I play based off that cutscene or based off the commercial, they're not going to go check out, you know, oh, how's the gameplay? Most people don't do that. Yeah. But if they see the commercial and they go, oh, that looks kind of cool. Then they'll go look at it for a second and go, yeah, I want to play this. Definitely. But indeed. if you don't grab them in that in that first impression, a lot of people are just done with it. And then, unfortunately, the internet. You, they hear a couple people say the same thing they do, and all of a sudden, that's the majority opinion, and it's over. And I, I like I said, because maybe it's just because of the retro market we're in. I mean, people really want RPGs. That's what I mean. RPGs are a huge thing, obviously. Yeah. But newer RPGs don't sell that well. No. And then a year later. They jump in price because everybody wants them. So I mean, I agree with you. I, I think it does. You see it a lot on eBay and whatnot. So they go onto the the black market and and the prices skyrocket from there, depending on the the accessibility of the actual game. Well, yeah, I think it's just because later down the road, more people realize, oh, this probably was a good game because more people were saying it was. So I want to try it now, and they have no problem paying that sixty, seventy, eighty dollar premium for that game they could have picked up for fifty or sixty or even twenty at certain times. Exactly because of that. Yeah, no, that's a, that's great points indeed. Uh, so that was a uh, a little bit of extra I'm there. Sorry, yeah. No, <laughs> that was Andrew. great. Uh, in regards to <laughs> at Game Source on Twitter, you can share your thoughts. But Retro City Games has a large community as well. They've got a, a massive audience that that interacts with each other on a daily basis and also interacts with Nicole and Doug on a well more than a <laughs> daily basis i can assure you so they're they're great indeed so check it out retro city games on facebook the leaders in video gaming right here at southern nevada so and we're back once again on the pop culture cosmos and now we're going to be talking about a game which uh for many uh has been uh, up and down uh, it's been a saga. I think it's probably the best way to say it. It's been a game that most people, like myself, thought would never see the light of day uh, after a certain point because there's been so many games that have been created 
There's so many games that have fell by the wayside. Some mm-hmm. of the series that have long have uh, been created, seen success, and and uh, been finished. Uncharted series. If, you, yes. if this is the last Uncharted, as we were talking about with Uncharted yeah, Four, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> think about it. The entire Uncharted series was introduced and also as well played out through four games in the entire time this game was in development. That game, the Enigma for Sony, which is The Last Guardian. Your thoughts on what The Last Guardian will be, how it's looked. I've seen the latest videos and trailers, which you can see on Game Source on Facebook. Um, you know, we, we've seen a lot already of footage on it and seen some play, play games and playthroughs on it. I uh, have mixed feelings on it myself, but I'll let you go ahead first on what your thoughts on The Last Guardian and its future success. Now that it's finally coming out, we think, to show, <laughs> store shelves. Next so time. when Sony announced it, um, I was extremely hyped for it. I just started playing Shadow of the Colossus at the time, and um, I know I was late to the game. And uh, was liking it, wasn't loving it, but I thought that game looked like something that I would be one. I think it was the lead marketing person somebody tweeted out there like man that's funny that kotaku knows more about my game than i do and the internet broke like as far as the gaming world they were like wait what because it was it was almost like being hopeful for that game coming out was almost a joke i mean we were eight years in it was like there is no way this game is (laughs) like like we were talking earlier the budget on something like that just even a passive budget has to be enormous because we were talking about before the podcast about the last guardian because at first doug and i were thinking maybe it wasn't it's not been that much uh comparative to other high budget games triple a shooters uh what have you gta's whatnot but then you realize and you calculate over the years even on years that they were not maybe putting full teams or forces into it there's still a cost so over the course of time you're talking about tens and tens of millions of dollars. Let's say the AAA, average AAA game makes, you know, or excuse me, costs around $150 million to make. Let's say around that, or GTA or what have you. I think we're talking in that range for The Last Guardian, if you calculate it out over the course of what, 10 years, maybe? Well, especially when you sit there and you go, the idea was thought they were, you know, kind of pushing it towards the PS2 era, and they go, we're going to start programming towards the PS3. And then realized the PS3 couldn't handle everything they wanted to do. So you've really had, and now it's coming out PS4, you've had really three separate, well, two and a half development cycles on this game where they kind of started over, or, you know, they started, said, no, we need to do it here. Then they started over completely. That's that's a lot of money. (laughs) So what are your realistic hopes on what The Last Guardian will do, and how do you think ultimately it will be received by the by the casual audience and core audience at large? So I watched the E3 announcement. Obviously, was it last year, year before? It was not this not this last E3, the one before that. Watched that, and um, the one that posted up 2016. You know, yeah, exactly, and that didn't. Yeah, it's barely gonna happen. (laughs) Um, But I I was I was super excited for it. Um, I, I the gameplay. I was a little bummed that they showed what they did. I didn't really like, I don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it, but the, the twist, not twist, but I'll say there's more of them. That was the weird thing that I was like, that's kind of a weird thing to, to show when you kind of thought this was an exclusive type thing. Yeah. I hope that was vague enough, but people still understood. Um, so I've kind of avoided the rest of it, like the plague, because anybody who hasn't played like a Shadow of the Colossus or Eco before, they're very ambient. It's, it's very much about the experience, not about, it, it's not about what's actually happening it's you filling in the gaps it's it's very much your journey yes and that's what i'm hoping to get out of this so i've kind of avoided everything else like the plague um kind of like when star wars came out i didn't watch it i saw the initial trailer and that was it i was Ah, done yep i i you 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 can ask nicole i uninstalled facebook on my phone to that extent i did not want to know i didn't want anything in the week leading up no spoilers for me so so yeah same idea i've i've i hope it's the same I hope it's that same level of immersion. I hope I, I can get emotionally involved in Let it. Let me ask Nicole. Did he actually uninstall Facebook? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, indeed. Uh, at, see, I got her to say something right <laughs> live on the air. That was, a, that was a first right there for you. But uh, <laughs> she's going to kill me later. But um, so your thoughts, do you think it actually, it, uh, turning a profit, I think, at this point is not possible. 
but do you think it actually can receive some type of commercial success here in the States? I think it'll sell well. I know, um, I mean, I, I don't know if they started making more. I know when Nicole and I pre-ordered the collector's edition, we picked that up and then it sold out for a while. Um, I don't, I mean, that to me was a good sign, but who knows what they were making. It might've been a follow type situation, a false demand. Um, from friends I've talked to that work at GameStop and stuff, they say it's mixed. It's people are hyped about it, but are not really pre-ordering it. So I don't know if that's good or bad, if that means people just don't want to... I think there's still that stigma that it, it might not come out, even though they have a date and everything. People are still, I think, hesitant about it. Um, I don't think it'll come anywhere near making a profit. I think right now it's all about just recouping money they've already put in it. I think it's just probably trying to get a game that has positive reviews so that it, they can attach itself to the system. Yeah. Because I know that PlayStation 4, since it's come out, has had its share of issues trying to build a library of self-sustaining games that have garnered some type of acclaim and quality. I know there's there's not that many in the library as I would have thought. Not that they haven't tried, but there's just a lot of games that they have... Um, Produced, made, and and has failed with the commercial audience. So it, it hopefully, like I said, I, I want to see success for this. I want to see uh, you know some some type of a, of a claim, and and hopefully it will tell a narrative and a good story that people can understand, fall, uh, follow, and appreciate. So I'm looking forward to it, but I, I don't hold up high, you know any hopes for it or any you know i'm not falling into the hype for it because of, of so many years of, of letdowns and disappointment um i agree i think part of what part of what might actually make money off of this is the merch side of it um i mean even at e3 just 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 the legend of the guardian t-shirts people were losing their minds that was like the thing to get i mean there, there was the zelda coin and then there was that and every i mean even afterwards i mean I'm not going to lie, I, I couldn't get one while we were there. We were working, and we were trying to buy them off eBay, and people were asking $80, $90, $100 for the, for the T-shirt. I mean, so I've already seen some small little merchandise trickling in, and they might be trying to recoup on that end a little bit. I mean, if it creates – I mean, Shadow Class and Eco stuff still sells pretty well when the limited stuff comes out. Sony has their store where they put out the limited edition art books and yeah. things like that. We might see stuff like that that might help recoup a little bit. Um, but like I said, I agree with you. I don't think they're going to turn a profit in any – way shape or form but like you said I, I i hope it's a great game i mean it looks like it's going to be but like i said i haven't seen too much of it intentionally as do, as do i and I, I hope it will get strong consideration for game of the year from you folks out there and also from us as well maybe we'll uh reconsider our thoughts with that title mm -hmm. uh when it comes out uh which you can share uh like i said cup, cup, upcoming right on the retro city games facebook page so you can share your thoughts. Your vote will be counted as far as it's concerned. Or you can give us a shout out on Twitter at PopCultureCosmo, at GameSource, or you know, GameSource or PopCultureCosmos on Facebook as well. Mm -hmm. So take a look forward to that in, indeed. Any last thoughts on, on what's going on with Retro City Games? Anything you're looking forward to as far as the gaming world before we uh, check on out? Right now we're just gearing up for the holidays, uh, trying to get everything in order for, like we were talking about earlier, Black Friday. And we will be having a sale. I won't tell you what it is, but... Watch our Facebook page for that. Um, it is the I don't I won't tell you what it is sale going on right now at Retro City Games. We're still well, we're still working out some things, but uh, yeah, no. So we, we will be doing stuff and just trying to gear up for the holidays. I mean, it's a like for every retailer, it's it's a busy time for us. Of course, of trying course. to get set for that and trying to find some time to play all the awesome games that are coming out, even though it's not going to happen. There's like we talked about way too many of them. Yes, <laughs> yes. But also, if you have a question out there as far as for your loved one, as far as for advice on, on what video games they should get, um, as far as that they may have here in the store, um, you want to check it out, Retro City Games on Facebook and shoot them a message because, Definitely. like I said, they will help you. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people are interested in getting retro games, retro gaming, things of that nature. Well, and uh, if The all... NES Classic, as you oh. know, has been a great <laughs> problem indeed for many, and uh, that's been a great issue indeed as far as trying to get those available. Did Nintendo make another mistake as far as its, its shipments are concerned? Well, they, it paid off with the Wii because obviously those shortages in the short term worked out into sales in the long term. Well, so we'll have I, to wait and see. I, I, I was talking to Smith this other day, like with console launches. Everybody's like, oh, why are they so limited when you know it'll sell? And I think it's that upfront. So you have the, you have the R&D and production costs, and then you have the manufacturing hours. So I, I mean, I guarantee Nintendo doesn't own the factory that's, that's pumping these out. They're 
this is what we need made and another factory does it and they're probably making products for Microsoft and Apple and different things so they said we'll make a million units with a hard cost of let's say 10 or 15 dollars a piece so they laid out all that money and stuff and, and did it and once demand gets bigger they keep pumping more out it, it, I mean it's it's good and bad they don't have to lay out a lot of money they recoup the money quickly and then on the flip side it creates a false demand for it when I mean they've already come out I think it was on their Twitter or Facebook where they already said there's gonna be multiple shipments between now and the Christmas. end of the year, yeah. So. I mean, so I, I the the prices are going for it. If you, if you don't have one, just wait. Yeah, don't buy it on mm-hmm. eBay, please, for two hundred, three hundred dollars. It's and I'm not. It's it's cool, but it's not worth it. Yeah. It. I mean, it's 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 really worth this. It's worth the sixty dollars they're asking. Anything more than that, I don't know if I'd really. I wouldn't personally pay more than that, but. Fair enough. Yeah. No, that's that's actually great thoughts indeed. I share them as well. And if you want, like I said, questions. Because they only answer a few a day, so, oh, actually right. a few dozen, I should say. Uh, but they do answer them, and they're great about doing it. It's Retro City Games on Facebook. Shoot them out a message if you want to talk about the retro gaming scene and have a question in regards to specific games, uh, specific titles. Um, they will be able to help you out as best they can because they are the leaders in re- video gaming right here in Southern Nevada. So. Thank you. Yeah, And if you are looking for something specific, um, let us know now. Especially if it's for Christmas or you're looking for somebody else or things like that. That's a good point. Because yes. it does get really, really busy, and the demand and our stock levels drop heavily on those, you know, harder to find and you know, because you learned titles. that last year as far as the oh, sales. Are, yeah. Oh yeah, well, it's, it's one of those things. I mean, every year it's it's you know a couple of weeks out, we're sold out of a lot of the bigger stuff, and I, I can try to hunt it down. But if you let me know now, there's a much better chance we can get it by the time Christmas rolls around. Then, if you let me know a week before, yeah, so uh, like the twentieth or what? Oh, exactly. Hey, I need, yeah, no, it's going to be really. And it hard. happens every year. I get people coming in. Oh, do you have an N sixty four with Mario Party and and all these things? And uh, a month uh, ago, yeah, I had three. You know, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, but uh, it works out. So please, if you have a question regarding a holiday gift in retro gaming, please do it early. Mm-hmm. Retro City Games on Facebook, and they will be happy. Nicole and Doug are do a tremendous job each and every day in answering those questions all day long because, again, they are the leaders in retro gaming and video gaming here in Southern Nevada. So I think that's going to do it for us um, on this episode of Pop Culture Cosmos. Once again, we are available every week, Monday nights, 10 p.m., Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific on the Podcast Radio Network. Again, give them a big shout out because they are our largest volume network. Also as well, the Tangent Bound Network and ESO Network. Those two great networks which have a large volume as well. We just truly appreciate being part of those networks just as much. And we truly thank them for being part of their team. Um, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, Podcast.com and popculturecosmos.wordpress.com. You can always catch our episodes as there as well. If you want to be an affiliate out there, I will let you know. Just give us a shout out, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Reach out to us. We are always happy to put ourselves into another place where people can hear us because getting the word out on how great this show is is, is always a first priority. Also as well, if you have any great ideas, just shoot us again a message, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com for us to talk about. Or if your guests want interested in becoming a guest on the show, we tape via YouTube Live. If you got a great topic to talk about, not a problem. Popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. So for us right here, and then once again, Retro City Games, Rob McCallum Films.com, uh, Wine, Women, and Words on YouTube, Mario Party Wars on Facebook. Game Source on Facebook and Twitter. And of course, my good friend Josh, I gotta plug Vendetta Dark one last <laughs> time on Amazon and his Ghost Toasters videos on popculturecosmos.wordpress.com. So, with that plug out of the way, I wanna say it's great to be back here again at Retro City Games. Any last thoughts before we check on out again? No. Um, have some fun playing some games this holiday. Exactly. If you can, be safe out there this holiday season. Travel, have fun. But please, watch out for others. It's that time of the year again when people get a little bit crazy, a little bit too much of the eggnog, so you want to make sure that you're out there being safe. Black Friday, people fighting for that, you know, that sale on the underwear or whatnot that, you know, my gosh. I've been in, that's, for me, it's a great rush being part of Black Friday and seeing all the stores and being in the middle of all the excitement. It kind of gives me a rush. But I know for some people, it can get really dangerous and get really uh, violent. So please be smart and be safe. 
and there's no Black Friday product pricing that that's worth hurting yourself or or getting yourself or your family endangered for. So please, that PSA is out there for you from from people who <laughs> have experienced Black Friday for many years now. You love it just as much <laughs> as you sides. do. On both sides. On both sides. So you love it just as much as you do, but don't want to see you uh, end up having a bad experience. So agreed. So for Douglas Hoyaboo, Nicole Galgazian, who was on the show, and also as well. Uh, me, Gerald Glassford, <laughs> who's going to get killed here in a minute. Uh, this is the Pop Culture Cosmos. want to thank you again for listening. want to thank you again for watching. It's a beautiful day in paradise, and here's hoping you have yourselves a great day.